Art and Inspiration is dedicated to bringing you purpose-driven content that will motivate and entertain you with thought-provoking conversations and somewhere along the line inspire you to pick up a pencil, pen, magic marker, and a piece of paper and draw. It is our hope that your time here today is time well spent. I'm Rita Rue. Welcome to Art and Inspiration Episode 3. Today's guest has committed to changing her life through Jesus Christ. She's a wife, a mother, and she's author of the book titled My Life in the Sunshine. Please help me welcome Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you. Sabrina, thank you for joining Art and Inspiration. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? I'm doing well, Sabrina. Um, like I said, thank you for taking time out of your schedule. I'm going to get started and uh, ask, why did you write this book? Um, actually, I was inspired by my husband, William Can't, also known as Can't Stop Will. Um, I went through quite a bit in life, and at the time that he met me, um, he was just really inspired from us talking back and forth on the phone. And um, when I met him, I was going through a difficult time. So for some reason, I hadn't shared it with anyone, but I felt comfortable in telling him and talking to him about the things that I went through. And um, when we were younger, we... And I was like, hmm, okay. I said, but I'm, I'm not healed, you know, from everything, so maybe but uh later on he began to push me you know to write because he see he saw the wisdom that i gained from a lot of things that i went through in life and he was just so surprised that i'm not bitter you know and that's very important not to be bitter <laughs> i found that better to we're losing our connection a little bit, but um, that's fine. We can take what you had right there. That was a good okay. intro. And okay. uh, if you were, you want to finish what you were going to say, or was your thought complete in that? Yes, I was just saying it's better to forgive. Mm -hmm. than I to agree carry. with that. Yeah. What was life like living in Syracuse, New York for you? Um, I don't remember much because I was about two or three years old when I left. I only remember that we had to enter the house upstairs and there was a lot of snow on the ground. That's okay. about it. <laughs> yeah. So in the opening of your book, you start off with an account of you at the age of around two years old, like you said, stepping into a hot tub. Can you tell us what happened if you can remember? Yes, I, um, I, um, the only thing that I remember is from my parents. Um, I don't recall the, uh, what happened at all. I don't even remember it. You know, my parents only told me that uh, my mom was heating up water. Back in those days, they heated water up through boiling it on the stove in large pots. And they were poured in the tub. And um, I must have... You know, I loved my dad so much that I followed him around. I was like his little shadow. So I must have saw him, you know, going in the bathroom to get in the tub or I don't know how far it went, you know, as far as me seeing him. But um, I guess I wanted to get in the, in the tub like him. Yeah, right. But I didn't know that the water had to cool down. Mm, yeah. but, um, I got in the tub, my mom said, and they didn't know. You know, I must have went and got in the tub and I must have fell in or something. But when I came out and I went to my dad and um, he just noticed the look on my face. And when he picked me up, he went to pick me up and he said, as soon as my hand, his hands touched me, my skin began to just roll up. Oh, on my wow. arm. man. Uh, you had a hospital stay there that I read in the book. How long were you in the hospital? I was in there for some months that they they told me because I don't even remember the hospital experience. And, mm. Wow. You know, yeah, I don't remember. They just told me that I 
never said anything to anyone. Wow. Like so you were nonverbal life. for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. When did you first speak again? Uh, my dad told me, asked me, he said, uh, he just asked me, why aren't you talking? You know, why aren't you doing anything? And he said, I opened my mouth and said, because I don't want to. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And then they say, hey, she's back. She's talking again. Yeah, the doctors were amazed because they, they had been talking to me through the whole thing. I wasn't saying anything. Would you I, say that you were carefully watched over by your parents as a child? Um, from what I can recall, yes. Yes, as um, you know, I remember us coming to Florida. You know, my mom kept us close. She held our hands. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, as we got older and she had more children, she always made us hold hands. And um, when we were teens, and we kind of stayed home by ourselves, and I don't know what happened. I think the house, you know, I was trying to cook something and it caught fire, but I was able to put the fire out. Then she had us go to uh, her pastor's uh, mother house to watch over us to make sure that none of us got hurt. In the book, you mentioned that your father was abusive to your mother. Did you ever yeah. witness any of the abuse? I heard it. I didn't see it because he always did it behind closed doors with my mother. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I did see him hit someone else, mm -hmm. you know, but as far as my mom, I just always heard it. I heard her screaming. I heard her, the, you know, the knocking around. Mm -hmm. you know. So at this point, I'm going to take a short break and show like a commercial. Tired of looking at regular old photos? Let Creative Artmosphere draw that photo as a fun caricature. Our artist, Rita Rue, is a warm and friendly creative that draws caricatures across America. Create a memory that will bring smiles and laughter for years to come. Creative Artmosphere can draw from photos submitted via email. To inquire about pricing, send a message to creativeartmosphere1 at gmail or on social media by message to Facebook at Creative Artmosphere. Also, you can send a direct message on Instagram to creative underscore artmosphere. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Creative Artmosphere and head over to Facebook and give the Creative Artmosphere page a like. Let us create a lasting memory for you and your family. Art and Inspiration, thought-provoking conversation with creative activity. I'm Rita Rue. I have Sabrina with me, the author of My Life in the Sunshine. Sabrina, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. After reading the first few chapters in your book, I'm curious to know why you chose the title, My Life in the Sunshine. What does that mean to you? That means a lot of my experiences and things that I can remember in life happened in Florida because that's where I pretty much grew up you know we went to florida south florida you know um, around the age of three or four something up like that and um and that's why i remember all of my life elementary school middle school high school you know and whatever schooling i did afterwards so pretty much my life was based in florida okay in the book you said that your father was a pimp and a drug dealer you yeah. also mentioned that he asked you to do work for him. What kind of work did you do for your father? I didn't do any work for him, but I was curious because I was at an age where I understood what a prostitute was. And I saw him dealing a lot with that. So I wondered, would I be a you know a prostitute? Would I be over them? And I also was at an age where I understood that he stole crap. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, you know, would I be a drug dealer or what? But I told him yes, you know, but he never uh, put me to work. He would take me different places, you know, and different things, but um, he would never involve me in his work. I did read, too, that you all had a tire shop. How did that come about? Do you know anything 
about the tire shop? Yes, I remember the tire shop. My mom found, she saw that uh, my dad was mechanically inclined. Mm -hmm. He, I don't think he ever went to, he never went to like mechanical school because my dad couldn't read or write. Um, but my mom saw that he could take a car apart and put it back together. So I don't know why they didn't do a mechanically, you know, like a, uh, what is it called? A, um, the one that worked the engine. I don't remember the name of it right now. But they opened a tire shop in Delray Beach off of mm -hmm. Atlantic Avenue. And we worked in the tire shop with my dad. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed it. Wow. I loved it. That's awesome. Interest into uh, entrepreneurship. Was your mom doing that in an effort to try to get him out of that street life of being a pimp and a drug dealer, do you think? Yes, I believe she did because my mom really loved my dad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, she she loved him and she really cared for him. And, you know, he wouldn't allow her to get a job. So this was a way where she could work and also they could work together. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rita Rue is the name that I call myself on social media. So let me give you a little history on the name Rita Rue. My mother, okay. my mother, mm -hmm. rest in peace. She used to lovingly call me Rita Rue whenever she greeted me on the phone or in person. Her greeting words were, Rita Rue, how are you? <laughs> and so I decided to use that term of endearment that she gave me as a brand name for my art projects and social media. That being said, Brenda Clay Farmer is the name printed on the book cover. Please tell me why you go by the name Sabrina. I go by the name Sabrina because uh, originally my name was Brenda Clay, but me and my mom have the same first and last middle name. I mean, first and last name, sorry. And Sabrina is my middle name. So I was always called Sabrina, or they would call me Sabrina Brina, you know. So now in the book, I did um, read a portion where you said, it was almost like you said you didn't like the name. Is that, can you talk about that? Why did you not like the name you were given? I didn't like the name because um, for years, I couldn't understand uh, why my mom, put up with my dad's abusiveness and why he put up, why she put up with him bringing other women around us, other women in our home. You know, why did she tolerate those things? I didn't understand that. And uh, I was angry with her um, because she didn't protect me as a kid when my, uh, my uncle uh, molested me. I was angry with her. I felt like it was her duty to protect me, yeah. you know, especially with me and, you know, with it happening in the same home that we lived in. And I blamed her. I don't know why I blamed her, possibly because I favored my dad as he favored me and my dad did no wrong in my eyes. Mm. I know that, you know, in the book on the cover, which I have right here, I'm going to show your book. Okay. But as I look at the cover, I see that there's helicopter, two helicopters with the light beaming down. What does that symbolize to you? That symbolized my teen years as I got older. Um, I saw that my brothers were, my, one of my brothers used to come in and he would give me like $50, $100. I'm like, where are you getting this money from? And um, from me being nosy and listening to their conversations, I found out they were stealing cars. And um, I was like, well, you know, I'm going to have fun, too. And I would go out and, you know, uh, I met a couple of ladies in the neighborhood, uh, uh, little girls or young girls my age. And um, that's what we did. We would steal cars. And um, one, one day, it was one night, there was a senior community that lived, that was like a couple of blocks from where we lived. And um we went to steal cars, but they were waiting for us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I hear the police sirens, the lights, <laughs> the helicopter. Wow. So um, I knew the shortcut to go the back way. And I ran 
and I left, you know, I bleached over the fence and I, in the back we had like a uh, washer and dryer covered by like a, a, a um, what is it called, a ladder, you know, with the wood. And um, I hid there and I laid down between the washing machine and dryer on the ground as the helicopter was all over in the backyard and I thought I was caught. Thank you for sharing that, Sabrina. Um, I also, were, were they new cars that you all were stealing or just, what was it? Uh, no, just just people's cars. <laughs> how old regular. Were you? you were 14? I had to be about that age, yeah. So you, did you know how to drive? Were you just winging it or you actually knew how to drive at that time? Because I remember just, when I, I was uh, 12 years old. Uh-huh. Uh, they used to let me drive up and down the street, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So I got some practice in. I guess at 14, I would have known what I was doing if I, you know, was behind the wheel of a, a car. Was that like your first time behind the wheel when you got in the cars? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was just winging it. So Sabrina, also on the cover of the book, I'm looking at what looks like. I see Boyton Beach mm-hmm. and I see Delray Beach. So I would assume were those two uh, communities that you lived in? Yes, those were the main two cities that I lived in, yes. Now, I also see on the cover of the book, there's a lot in the cover of this book uh uh-oh, right here. Um, These look like security gates. Yes. What what is this symbolizing? That symbolized that um, I went to jail quite a bit for different things, you know. Um, if I was not, uh, <laughs> if I wasn't, you know, selling drugs, trying to sell drugs, I was holding somebody's gun, um, I was fighting, you know, and then eventually, because of the points that I heard, I ended up in prison. You know, um, okay. So it was a point system. You said so many points, and then the well, why did they do a point system? Was it because of your age, or they did it? Be, they did it uh, statewide. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did it a lot of states in uh, the United States. They develop a point system because people were continually getting arrested, getting slapped with three or four months, and then they'll go back out, commit another crime, mm-hmm. do another three months, four months, five months, six months leave again and you know because of the recidivism of the returning okay now all together how much time did you do in in prison was it prison or jail what's the difference between the two uh jail is like um where you first get arrested mm-hmm. and you are given a charge and then you have to go back and forth to court to decide what you're going to be charged with And then after they decide what you're going to be charged with, they kind of look at your life a little bit and see, you know, how often have you been arrested? And then um, jail is kind of like a, like a holding place more like, and then prison is different because you are shipped away, away from your family. Uh, Sometimes people are allowed to stay near their family if they request it, Mm -hmm. but most of the time you're sent away from prison and it's more like it's almost like a jail but it's a place where you spend longer time in prison you know anything over a year and a day you're going to prison so were you, you were in prison or yes okay I went to prison. now how long were you in there five years five years one month and three days okay you knew it down to a t mm-hmm. did you think that time there um was time that you needed to change your life? What do you yes. what do you think about the time you had to serve? Um, yes, I, I believe it was. I was tired, um, overwhelmed from life, and I had just given up. Um, I had children by that time. And, mm-hmm. um, my charges for my oldest son, where I ended up in prison, um, I, I beat him. Mm -hmm. I spanked him and it turned to a beating. Okay. And um, and that I don't remember the first time I hit him to the last. I don't. And um, 
But by that time that I did go in, you know, it was relief for me. It was relief because I was overwhelmed with trying to take care of the kids. You know, um, my son, my oldest son is um, bipolar, schizophrenic, and he has a lot of uh, mental development issues, which we didn't understand Mm -hmm. uh, coming up back then. You know, um, I didn't understand what was going on with my family didn't, and my family was against him being put on medication. So trying to work with him, getting fired from job after job, I was just, I was just over it. I had had it. Mm-hmm. And um, so when I stepped in, I was like, oh, I can, I found that I could just kind of calm down and relax. And I had, um, you know, with me going in, my situation with being in church was like, that's it. I'm done. You know, I'm just going to chill here. I'm, you know, as long as nobody don't bother me, I won't bother them. You know. So were there a lot of opportunities for you to get rehabilitation as far as education or some type of counseling there? Yes, I did. Yes. Yeah, it was at that time, it was a lot of it. You know, I began to immediately see the psychologists there who work with uh, people as far as anger management, because I was known for, you know, getting angry and, and what they call, we call it snapping. Mm-hmm. You know, I was good for that. Mm-hmm. You know, if you bothered me or you bother one of my snip siblings, I would snap at you. I would snap on you, you know, and don't, God forbid you pass the lick, you know. Uh-oh, yeah. <laughs> I made you regret it. <laughs> so, um, and um, some things that they said about me in court, I didn't want to be that way. I wanted to be a better person. I just didn't know how mm-hmm. to go about it, you know. Uh, but I wanted to be better. So I began to enroll in counseling and um, anger management. Um, but uh, I have the letter with me. The lady told me, she said, you don't have anger issues. You just don't tolerate foolishness and you need to know the right way to handle it. She said, you've learned the, lo- the wrong way from your parents fighting and carrying on to handle it. So you feel like physical abuse is the way to handle stuff and it's not. And um, also, I got involved in um, accounting classes, bookkeeping, in which I do still have my certificates for, you know, and I have college credits and things like that. And, um, um, so just uh, to ask a little question, when you were in school, were you able to keep your interest throughout high school? Or was it just this time away that you were actually able to focus on uh more like uh, academics and things like that. What what would you say? In high school, I didn't have any, I don't know why I didn't have any goals for anything. Um, well, when I was younger, I had a goal, but my dad told me it was for sissy. So I lost interest in a lot of things. I'm sorry, your dad said what I didn't understand. Um, he said what I was interested in was for sissy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why he told me that, but I wanted to be a ballerina. That's what okay. All right. So that made me lose interest in a lot of things. You know, mm-hmm. I just couldn't find where, you know, where to go. So you your know. dad's opinion was very important to you. Yes, it, yes it was. Yeah. His word was bond to me. His word was life. Yeah. Were you actually trying to emulate him when you um, sold drugs and things like that? Um, not really. I didn't, I didn't like the, what I saw of people. I didn't Mm -hmm. like the downward phases I saw of people. Um, when I tried to sell drugs, it was more for money purposes because Mm -hmm. with my my mom and my dad divorced, we were poor, Mm -hmm. you know, because we didn't have all the money and the cars and all of those things. And when my dad left, my mom found an old beat up station wagon you know that's what she was able to purchase you know with whatever money she had so I didn't want to live poor is there anything else that you want to cover Sabrina that I haven't touched on yet yeah I just want to um touch on that um I've learned 
so much. And um, God is so good. When I didn't want anything to do with him, it's like when I was in prison, it's like one day he kind of picked me up off my feet and took me into the chapel. Like, I, I, you know, I was like resisting. And I'm, I'm literally, it's like he picked me up off my feet mm-hmm. and put me in that chapel. And that day they were doing a class called uh, Peacemakers. And they began to talk about forgiveness and how it could help you. And it's like he touched my heart. And I haven't been the same since, you know, and I appreciate that. And um, uh, I don't want to spend too much time, but uh, I even got in a car accident. And uh, the doctors told me I wouldn't make it. They told me there was nothing they could do for me. I had cut my liver, mm-hmm. but uh, I didn't see anything going in and out of uh, in coma and stuff like that. But I knew that when I came through, and I was alive, I knew he had healed me. I now I know that I have a purpose. And, and that's what I kind of pushed today. And I asked him to give me a heart like Joseph to not, but you know, be angry with his brothers or other people, you know, um, through all the things that I've been through, which are in the book. But he gave me that heart. You know, they say I'm like a will. He gets mad at me. He's like, you're like a kid. One day you're upset with somebody. The next day you act like they've never even hurt you. Mm. you know? And so I really believe that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, no matter who or when or where. You know, it means a lot when you can love someone unconditionally in spite of the things that they've done in their life. Uh, A lot of times people do what they do because they don't know any better. Um, When I think back to my stepfather, who was Reverend Isaac Ashford, um, he would preach a repetitive sermon, a message over and over again. We heard it often. And one day on our way home, from church, I asked him why he preached that message so much. And he said, because people are not doing better. And I asked, what do you mean by that? And he answered, if you know better, you'll do better. And until people know better, I'll keep preaching that message. When they learn better, then I can move on to something else. And those words kind of they, they rang true to me because, you know, you can judge people all day long on the things that they do in life, but a lot of times they do what they do because they don't know anything better to do. And until they learn that, then that's when, well, at that point they can turn their life around or allow God to turn their life around as such as you have and go from that point forward and live not die but you live into you know your new life what you did yesterday is behind you yesterday is dead and gone tomorrow is not promised all you have is your right now so you live life according to how you know is right for you right now and you know I wanted to say that about your book it is very inspiring to see you. you change your life the way that you have you know that you you knew that you needed a change and you did you allowed God to use you in your life and mold you into what he would have you to be what Mm -hmm. advice do you have for young troubled teenagers um that may be looking for a way and thinking they're stuck do you have anything you could say to someone yes I do it doesn't matter where you are today It doesn't matter what you've done or how far you've come. It doesn't matter even if you're incarcerated with a life sentence. God is still real and he hears. He hears. His heart is genuine. And I'm not talking about human genuine. I'm talking about God genuine. If you call him 
and you're willing to say, okay, I don't know better. I need you to teach me what's better. You know, um, he's willing to teach you. And I find that his word is so repetitive, just like your granddad's <laughs> message. His word is so repetitive from Genesis to Revelation. He wants us to do what's right. He has put in his word what is right. He's put it there and it can be done. And he's given us an example, his son, Jesus. He hasn't even left us there because when Jesus left, he sent his spirit and his spirit mm -hmm. is here to help us, to guide us and to lead us, you know. But if we, we have to take the time to say, okay, I can't keep reacting the way that I used to, you know, like I had to learn and even still, I have to be reminded today, I can't put my hands on everything and everyone that I feel crosses me. I could be right. But what? how does God want me to respond? The love that he's given me, I'm learning. He wants me to give that same love to somebody else. So, you know. Serena, <laughs> thank you so much. You said a lot right there. Um, for everybody listening out there and, uh, you know, it's that time of year where you can stuff a stocking or put a gift under the tree. We ask that you consider putting this under the tree as a kiss, uh, Christmas gift. Yes. This is, uh, my life in the sunshine by Brenda Clay Farmer. Tell them how they can get a copy of your book. It is on Amazon and it's only $13. I didn't want it to be a lot because to me, it's, it's, it's a need to know that you can come from the worst to get to the best. God is the best. His yeah. life is the best. No. Sabrina, thank yes. you so much for joining Art and Inspiration episode three. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Until next time, this has been Rita Rue of Creative Atmosphere and Sabrina. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>